Greetings and welcome to our study on the book of Genesis. I am the Bible Paladin and look forward to continuing this journey as we walk with Jacob as he begins to forge his own path with his relationship with the Lord. In the last chapter, Jacob fools his father and receives his blessing by pretending to be his older brother, Esau. And Esau doesn't take it too lightly. I hate you. And so with Esau pledging to kill his brother, their mother, Rebekah, tells Jacob to flee to her brother's house in Haran. And we also see what appears to be the insertion of another tradition in which Isaac is the one who tells Jacob to leave. But his reasoning is for him to find a wife to carry on the family lineage. And so we'll continue with the last verse of chapter 27 and then continue with chapter 28. So we ask the Lord to bless our reading of the sacred word. Rebecca said to Isaac, I am disgusted with life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob also should marry a Hittite woman, a native of the land, like these women, what good would life be to me? Isaac therefore called Jacob, greeted him with a blessing, and charged him, You shall not marry a Canaanite woman. Go now to Paran Aram, to the home of your mother's father, Bethuel, and there choose a wife for yourself from among the daughters of your uncle Laban. May God Almighty bless you and make you fertile, multiply you that you may become an assembly of peoples. May he extend to you and your descendants the blessing he gave to Abraham, so that you may gain possession of the land where you are staying, which he assigned to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way. He went to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, and brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Esau noted that Isaac had blessed Jacob when he sent him to Padan Aram to get himself a wife there, charging him as he gave him his blessing not to marry a Canaanite woman, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and gone to put on Aram. Esau realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac, so he went to Ishmael, and in addition to the wives he had, married Mahalath, the daughter of Abraham's son Ishmael, and sister of Nebaioth. Based on Rebekah's severe judgment of Esau's choice in marrying the Hittite women, Isaac sends Jacob to find a wife from one of Laban's daughters, just as Abraham had sent his servant to find a wife for him from the same place, Haran or Padam Aran. Because of the importance of continuing the family line, Isaac takes this as an opportunity to bless Jacob, realizing that it will be through him and not through his brother Esau that God's promise to Abraham will be fulfilled. Also, if we see this as the continuation of the story of Jacob's deception, this gives his parents another motive for sending him away, instead of focusing on Esau's murderous plot. This blessing echoes the blessing that Isaac himself received from God and invokes the blessing of Abraham, including both descendants and possession of the land. When viewed as a different version of the story, Esau is not given the first blessing because he already married Canaanite women. However, like in the previous chapter, Esau wants to be blessed by his father. So the impulsive Esau looks for a way to remedy the situation. In his mind, he must find a direct descendant of Abraham, so he goes to the family of Ishmael to marry one of his daughters as well. Probably not the best choice. He must have not been aware that Ishmael was also rejected by Abraham. Can't catch a break. One really begins to feel sorry for Esau in these chapters. But we're going to leave him behind for now as we continue to follow Jacob. Jacob departed from Beersheba and proceeded toward Haran. When he came upon a certain shrine, as the sun had already set, he stopped there for the night. Taking one of the stones at the shrine, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep at that spot. Then he had a dream. A stairway rested on the ground with its top reaching to the heavens, and God's messengers were going up and down on it. And there was the Lord standing beside him and saying, I, the Lord, am the God of your forefather Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you are lying I will give to you and your descendants. These shall be as plentiful as the dust of the earth, and through them you shall spread out east and west, north and south. In you and your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall find blessing. Know that I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. I will never leave you until I have done what I promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he exclaimed, Truly the Lord is in this spot, although I did not know it. In solemn wonder he cried out, how awesome is this shrine! This is nothing else but an abode of God, and that is the gateway to heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head, 
set it up as a memorial stone, and poured oil on top of it. He called that site Bethel, whereas the former name of the town had been Luz. Jacob then made this vow. If God remains with me, to protect me on this journey I am making, and to give me enough bread to eat and clothing to wear, and I come back safe to my father's house, the Lord shall be my God. This stone that I have set up as a memorial stone shall be God's abode. Of everything you give me, I will faithfully return a tenth part to you. On the way to Haran, Jacob stops at a certain shrine, which is interesting because usually the author of Genesis is very good about telling us the specific names of places. And yet here, both the reader and Jacob are unaware of where he stops, and this leads to the suspense of the story. And then we are told that Jacob dreams, just as Abraham dreamt in his first encounters with God and some of the first promises of the covenant. In this dream, we are given the image that has often been called Jacob's ladder. Although the Hebrew word salam is one that is not found elsewhere in scripture, and there is uncertainty to the exact meaning. The verb associated with it, salal, means to heap up or stack something, which might refer to a ramp or sloping road. The image could be that of a stairway or a Babylonian ziggurat. As is with the nature of dreams, it would be difficult to describe in any language. The meaning, however, is that this ladder or stairway that led from the ground, the land, up to the heavens or the dwelling of God and his holy court, which is why Jacob saw the messengers or angels traversing it. Jacob is then informed that the land where he was resting is indeed blessed, and he receives the same blessing as Abraham. The image from the dream tells him that God is connected to the land, and that Jacob and his descendants will have access to God. The Lord also offers him his protection throughout his travels, even outside of the promised land. Upon waking, Jacob immediately praises God and erects a pillar, signifying it as a sacred place, just as Abraham had built an altar. And when he refers to the place as Bethel, which means house of God or abode of God, we are reminded that God had appeared to Abraham at this place as well. Jacob's oath to God is also noteworthy. Typically in these exchanges, it is God who says, if you do such and such, then I will be your God. But here Jacob reverses it and says, God, if you do this for me, then you can be my God. And so Jacob hasn't quite accepted the God of his fathers. And maybe he's also afraid of his brother Esau. And so he's really praying that God will continue to protect him. Either way, Jacob still has some growing to do on his own journey. And so let's see where this takes him as we continue with chapter 29. After Jacob resumed his journey, he came to the land of the Easterners. Looking about, he saw a well in the open country, with three droves of sheep huddled near it, for droves were watered from that well. A large stone covered the mouth of the well. Only when all the shepherds were assembled there could they roll the stone away from the mouth of the well and water the flocks. Then they would put the stone back again over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, Friends, where are you from? We are from Haran, they replied. Then he asked them, Do you know Laban, son of Nahor? We do, they answered. He inquired further, Is he well? He is, they answered. And here comes his daughter Rachel with his flock. Then he said, There is still much daylight left. It is hardly the time to bring the animals home. Why don't you water the flocks now? and then continue pasturing them. We cannot, they replied, until all the shepherds are here to roll the stone away from the mouth of the well. Only then can we water the flocks. While he was still talking with them, Rachel arrived with her father's sheep. She was the one who tended them. As soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of his uncle Laban, with the sheep of his uncle Laban, he went up, rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well, and watered his uncle's sheep. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and burst into tears. He told her that he was her father's relative, Rebekah's son, and she ran to tell her father. When Laban heard the news about his sister's son, Jacob, he hurried out to meet him. After embracing and kissing him, he brought him to his house. Jacob then recounted to Laban all that had happened, and Laban said to him, You are indeed my flesh and blood. Just as Abraham's servant meets Rebekah at the well, now we see Jacob meet Rachel at the well. And because it involves him directly, it really serves as a powerful love story. When he gets there first, he inquires about Laban's family to make sure he's in the right place. And this story revolves really around the sheep and the shepherds, instead of camels as it did in the other story. And we hear that Rachel is one of the shepherds. She doesn't go to the well to get water for the family, but she is the one pastoring the sheep. She is the strong daughter. And they are waiting for the other shepherds to come to take the stone away from the well. 
So suddenly when seeing Rachel, Jacob gets this newfound strength and he goes and removes the stone all by himself. Remember, Jacob was not the stronger brother. And yet he sees Rachel and he cries out and weeps for joy, which may be an indication of this love at first sight, because even Rachel is excited and she runs back to go tell her father. And then Laban greets him, and after hearing the story, he says, you are my bone and flesh, or my flesh and blood. And so he welcomes him into his family. So let's see what happens next. After Jacob had stayed with him a full month, Laban said to him, should you serve me for nothing just because you are a relative of mine? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The older was called Leah, the younger Rachel. Leah had lovely eyes, but Rachel was well-formed and beautiful. Since Jacob had fallen in love with Rachel, he answered Laban, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban replied, I prefer to give her to you rather than to an outsider. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, yet they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may consummate my marriage with her, for my term is now completed. So Laban invited all the local inhabitants and gave a feast. At the nightfall, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob consummated the marriage with her. Laban assigned his slave girl Zilpah to his daughter Leah as her maidservant. In the morning, Jacob was amazed. It was Leah. So he cried out to Laban, How could you do this to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why did you dupe me? It is not the custom in our country, Laban replied, to marry off a younger daughter before an older one. Finish the bridal week for this one, and then I will give you the other two in return for another seven years of service with me. Jacob agreed. He finished the bridal week for Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel in marriage. Laban assigned his slave girl Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her maid servant. Jacob then consummated his marriage with Rachel also, and he loved her more than Leah. Thus he remained in Laban's service another seven years. Being accepted as part of the family, Jacob stays about a month, helping out and working as other members of the household would. And then Laban offers to pay him, thinking perhaps that marriage may be in the future. And this shows a big difference from the story that we had with Rebekah, where Abraham's servant comes with all of the promises of Abraham's wealth. Jacob, on the other hand, really comes as a fugitive, alone and with nothing, which shows that whether he realizes or not, he really is relying on the promise of God. And when asked about his wages, Jacob requests for Rachel's hand in marriage and pledges seven years of service. Laban accepts this proposal, and for Jacob, these seven years, seven meaning perfection or wholeness, goes by quickly because of his love for Rachel. And then is the time for him to marry. And so they would throw a wedding feast in the evening, and eventually, towards the end of the evening, the bride would come to him and they would consummate the marriage. Now, how did Jacob not realize that this was Leah and not Rachel? It was in the evening, there would have been no lights in the tent, and Jacob could have been a little bit drunk from the feast. But either way, he wakes up in the morning next to Leah and is outraged. He, of course, goes to Laban and says, what have you done to me? This is so unfair. How could have you switched women on me? Now, if you were thinking this seems a little bit familiar, you might be right. Remember how Rebekah switched sons on Isaac so that one would receive the blessing instead of the other? Afterwards, Esau cried about how unfair it was, yet his father told him that he could not take back the blessing. Just as Laban said, he could not revoke the marriage. Since Jacob was complicit in deceiving his father, it seems that he must now face an equally bad deception. He does receive punishment, after all, for his trickery. Poetic justice at that. So after seven years of service, he still does not have the wife for whom he worked. And after the customary week, eventually then will be able to marry Rachel. And he agrees to another seven years of service because of his love for her. So it seems that the trickster was finally beaten in his own game. We will finish this chapter next time as it begins the story of his children and the jealousy between the wives. But first, let's look a bit more closely at what we might take away from the narratives we heard today. This ancestor narrative about Rachel and Jacob is also a love story, from their first meeting at the well to his agreement to serve seven years and an additional seven years in order to marry her. The night before he met her at the well, he had an encounter with God, and God promised to be with him on his journey. So how often do we involve God in our relationships? 
When we think about dating or falling in love, so much of what we see today does not involve God. Yet how often have we heard the phrase, God is love? If we believe that, what better place to involve God than in our relationships, especially our romantic ones? I think because of the way in which much of Christian culture has turned romantic love and sex into something dirty or taboo to talk about, we somehow feel awkward about seeing this as a gift from God. One of the Lord's first commandments to human beings was to be fertile and multiply. The stories of Abraham and family are so often centered around that promise of God that deals specifically with that directive. Today, too, we might find consolation in the idea that God continues to offer guidance in every aspect of our relationships. Another theme in the passages that we read today involves trial and growth. When Jacob dreams of the stairway to heaven, he may have noticed a few things. One is that the path to heaven is created by God, not by human hands. Unlike the story of the Tower of Babel, it is God who initiates the tower that reaches to the heavens. So it is our dependence on God that will reveal this to us. It is also not an easy path or immediate access to God. Even the angels have to travel across the great expanse between the heavens and the earth. This is not to say that we can't approach God directly, but that it is not transactional, as so many interactions tend to be today. It is relational, which takes time and growth. When Jacob wakes up, he is still uncertain of his relationship with God. His act of deceit brought him to this place, but God assures him that he will not abandon him. Jacob, for his part, tells God that he will only come to invoke him as his Lord when these trials are complete and he has returned home safe. At this point, Jacob is not ready to accept his father's faith. As an indication of the growth that he still must endure, he himself is tricked by his future father-in-law and goes through 14 years of trial in a foreign land. God's promises are fulfilled through him, but not in a way that he had expected. When we face trials in our own lives, it is very possible that they are part of the Lord's greater plan, and in the end, allow us to grow in virtue and in faith. As we continue with this tale, we will see that Jacob's trials are still far from over. In fact, strife and struggle seem to play a big part in this family's history. And so I do hope you'll join me next time as we begin to hear about Jacob's children. And also, this is my 20th episode. And so if you're enjoying these videos and these conversations, please subscribe and, you know, hit all those thumbs up and bells and all of that stuff. It's free and it helps this video and this channel to get out to more people. And so until next time, trust in God and do good.